Greetings, I'm Sonny Fox. Tonight, a one-hour Superstars Radio Network special. Yes Music, an evening with John Anderson. Interviewed by national radio consultant Lee Abrams. We'll cover the entire history of Yes from the beginning to the present. From their first album to their present. It's a fascinating show, and we'll begin right after this pause. And now, John Anderson. Your first yeah. record started giving you rushes. The first kind of records that moved you. What type of music or what type well, of stuff? Well, there was. Uh, I mean, this is back to grade school. Oh you know? yeah, yeah. Everly Brothers. Everly Brothers. Yeah, and Elvis and Eddie Cochran. And general, generally, the Everly Brothers because of the the kind of harmonising and the melody lines and things like that. <laughs> and Bing Crosby. And Bing Crosby. <laughs> That's quite, that's just odd because you think of John Anderson like must have been Stravinsky when he was six or something. Oh, really? It would have been tremendous uh, yeah. to be to be aware of that. I always liked to, to listen to uh, kind of very emotional classical music because I'd listen to it at the, by the radio mm-hmm. and go through this kind of uh, dying routine. <laughs> yeah. You know, any heavy kind of romantic music, I always used to kind of crawl up into a bowl and just kind of try to disappear into the music right. because it was it would have been wonderful i guess to have that kind of musical depth in an early age oh right how yeah. about the early uh what call orchestral groups of vanilla fudge nice were they much of an influence in the oh, totally yeah mm-hmm. totally i think vanilla fudge's first album was such a, a breakthrough for a band like that and it was a very strong influence on a lot of people in so many ways at that point in time when the, the kind of uh, things were developing towards the end of the 60s at that time, about 68, I think, Vanilla Fudge came with the album. And it was so well orchestrated in a way um, that uh, it set a lot of people going off on these kind of ideas. And the Nice, again, they used uh, the actual classics to reproduce on stage and because they were classic uh, pieces of music anyway uh, just to hear them in a club was heavy yeah. it was a real uh, exciting period hmm. 68 yeah, so 67 68 right. how about uh, the Beatles when they sort of uh, transferred from the rock into the more conceptual stuff like Sgt. Pepper and well that, yeah like that. I think that that had such that a heavy. Really started at all, I guess. Really, well, the Beatles uh, initially got a lot of people out of the kind of possible mundane situation to get into uh, going seeing bands, being in bands, and going seeing groups and being in groups. And it was like uh, that revolution that they were they were always hinting at was happening, and, and they were kind of the the actual. Uh, pushers of that, yeah. and they were they were front runners along with a lot of other uh, fine kind of musicians of the time. You know the Beach Boys and uh, Stones, Zappa, all pushing. But the Beatles were like a strong pinnacle for th- millions of people, right. and for mi- thousands of musicians, millions of musicians. What were your early groups, Warrior and Gun? I hear that sounds like violent. Oh, right. The Warriors, they were kind of a uh, band from the hometown. And we were a very uh, well-rehearsed band. And we, we did the Beatles like the Beatles. And we did the Stones like the Stones. And uh, Four Tops like the Four Tops. And Beach Boys like the Beach Boys as much as we could. Because that was the early training you get into, too. Yeah. And... Um, very exciting times, very youthful uh, kind of 
whizzing around in broken down vans and things for about five years, uh, touring Europe and so on. At that point uh, in time when we were in Germany, um, I decided to leave the band and uh, I wanted to travel around the world at the time. I wanted to go, go off and seek my kind of existence somewhere else. Um, when I came back to London, I started looking for a, a group to work with. Having seen so many groups in London, there was one group called Gun, The Gun, and they were just reforming again. Mm -hmm. They'd been together as a band for about two years, and then they were reforming again. So I got involved for about two months, and that was all really. Oh. Did. We did two gigs, uh, very exciting gigs. We, we, we played once with uh, the family, and once with the Who, mm. it can't be bad. I mean, they were big. <laughs> I mean, the family were, was a very big uh, English band, mm -hmm. and uh, for a long time. Rick Rex band. Right? Yeah. Now you always hear these stories about uh, Yes fans about uh, you were a bartender and you met Chris Squire in a club. Yeah. And that was the beginning of Yes. Right. Yes, in know. some ways, it was. <laughs> Working in uh, the Chass Club, which is in Water Street, the music area of uh, Soho, the Marquis there and a few other clubs. And all the musicians would go to the Chass Club for after and before gig drinks kind of thing. And I was uh, kind of hanging in there and helping out, just generally look, looking for a gig, but in the meantime, helping out in this small club. And uh, that's where we got to meet a lot of musicians and we started to, I started to see what was going on and uh, just bided my time. And then there was that uh, fateful afternoon, it was just me and Chris in the bar. I was at one end of the bar and Chris was at the other end of the bar and we'd never met. And my friend Jack Barry, who now runs the Marquee Club, as it happens, he was managing that Shas Club. And he said, you've got to come and meet this guy over here, he's a bass player, he's getting a band together, I think you could get it together. And so he introduced us, and uh, we just chatted for about half an hour, and I went round to his house and we sang some songs together. And uh, that's how we realised there was every possibility that we should work together. Who was the next member to join the band? If I remember, um, Tony Kay. All right. How did you find uh, Tony? Well, Tony was um, he was known to uh, Chris Squire, and it's funny that I knew I'd, I'd, I worked with Tony about three years previously with the Warriors. He was with another band, so when we met, we we knew of each other. <laughs> Started rehearsing down in uh, Shaftesbury Avenue. It was a small uh, cafe. It was in the basement of a cafe, and the cafe was called the Lucky Horseshoe. And the next step was to find a drummer. We saw an advertisement in the Melody Maker for a drummer. So we rang him up and I asked him what kind of kit he had. Because I think if it, 
At that time, I was thinking, well, if, if he is good, it's got to be a little good kit that he's got. And if he isn't good, he's got a, you know, a, a cheaper kit, which is a silly way of <laughs> things, you know. And he said he had a, a Ludwig kit. Oh, was it the one that was painted? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a Ludwig kit, but it was. <laughs> So that was Bill, and uh, Peter Banks came along, who was uh, a friend of Chris's. And Chris had mentioned Peter a couple of times, and uh, but he was busy with another band. Mm -hmm. But eventually he came along, and we got into rehearsing for a month, and that's how we got on the road. <laughs> Yes, music, an evening with John Anderson. A Superstars Radio Network special will continue right after this pause. <laughs> 